free and clear of the chatter from Wall Street, you're listening to Talking Stocks Over Beer, hosted by hedge fund veteran and newsletter writer Mike Alkin, who helps ordinary investors level the playing field against the pros by bringing you market insights and interviews with corporate executives and institutional investors. Mike sifts through all the noise of mainstream financial media and Wall Street to help you focus on what really matters in the markets. And now, here is your host, Mike Alkin. Welcome to the podcast. It's Monday, March 26, 2018. Hope you had a nice weekend. A very volatile week last week. Uh, market volatility continued for the second week in a row. It's been like this for, I think, the last six weeks or so. I mean, equities got pounded last week. It was the second straight week of losses. And it was the usual concerns, at least of late. We saw a lot of investor uncertainty about rising interest rates. Tariffs and trade wars were front page news. And then you added to the mix the Facebook data scandal. For the S&P, the NASDAQ, and the Dow, losses range between 5.7 and 6.5%. And that was a sell-off since the big one we had in early February. On Monday of last week, Facebook got the week off to a pretty rough start, though. They fell 7% following the reports that research firm Cambridge Analytica mined the data of 50 million Facebook users without their consent. And then they went on and used that to deliver targeted pro-Trump ads during the presidential campaign. I remember a time when data privacy was before uh, Twitter and and Facebook where people were really concerned about their data being private. But now everyone puts puts so much out there for the world to see. But but we do have a certain reasonable expectation that that the data we share with with these companies stays within them. But uh, I guess with the news that we saw so much, so much for that about your data being private. On Wednesday, monetary policy last week was at the four. The Fed raised rates again, the, which is the overnight rate that banks lend to each other. They raised it by a quarter point uh, to a target of between one and a half and one point seven five seven five percent, which wasn't a big surprise. And uh, what what should have been viewed as positive news, the, the Fed's forecast was that there'll be three rate hikes this year. Some people were expecting four, but it they held it at three. But the market is looking forward and it's anticipating it's going to need to, to keep raising and tightening uh, policy over the next couple of years throughout 2020. And as you've heard me say before, rising rates scare equity investors. And then the trade wars, we've talked a lot about that, so I'm not going to spend too much time harping on it. But On Thursday, President Trump signed a presidential memorandum allowing for tariffs of up to $60 billion worth of Chinese goods. And the Chinese came back and said they're going to levy duties on $3 billion of U.S. imports. Now, I'm recording this. It's Monday morning. And over the weekend, there was news that the Chinese want to sit at the table and talk to the U.S. about uh, avoiding a trade war. And the markets are reacting well to that so far. The markets just opened a little bit, and I think they, the Dow opened up 400 points. But we'll see. A lot can happen in any week. For the week, 11 of the 11 S&P sectors finished the week in negative territory. Uh, tech got pounded, down almost 8%. Financials didn't fare well either. They were down about 7%. In healthcare, normally a uh, – a uh, more conservative group and one that's more of a safety group was down almost 7% as well. Energy uh, held up, though, for the most part, down barely 1%. Uh, the energy group benefited from a, a jump in the price of crude as, as West Texas Intermediate, the benchmark, uh, was up almost 6% to about uh, almost 66 bucks a barrel. And that's the highest it's been since January. So a lot going on in the markets, a lot of volatility. It continues, and as I continue to tell you, I would use these opportunities uh, when you do see lifts in the market uh, to continue to lighten equity exposure. Today, I want to spend some time talking about something that I think is very critical for you to think about when you think about long-term investing success. I mean, obviously, you need to have more winners than losers, and hopefully your winners are bigger than your losers, 
But I want to talk about how you determine which stocks you choose, because I think that's key to determining which stocks will go a long way towards helping you achieve what you're hoping to achieve. And the internet and social media, when I think about that and the role it's played in investing, I mean, it's changed our lives forever. And there, I don't think there's any going back. It's here to stay. And I think the uses and utility are only going to increase. I mean, podcasts are a great example of that. Think about the utility of podcasts. I mean, you could be listening to me right now. You could be sitting on a plane, uh, either on the runway or you're up in the air. You might have downloaded the podcast before you took off. I could be keeping you company on the drive into work. You could be sitting in bumper to bumper traffic. If you are as, as a New Yorker, I, I totally feel your pain. You could be listening to me on your laptop while you're doing something else. But wherever and however you're listening to me, it's courtesy of the internet. And as a listener, you had to hear me somehow. You might have seen something I tweeted. I'm footnotes first on Twitter. You might be a subscriber to mine or Frank Curzio's newsletters. Subscriptions driven likely courtesy of hearing about uh, me through the internet. You might have watched one of my conference presentations or interviews that appear on YouTube, courtesy of the internet. But you're listening because you have an interest in getting investment ideas or becoming a better investor. But I am just one of countless number of people who do investing podcasts and talk about stocks, talk about the markets, the equity markets, the, the bond markets. My goal is to educate you about it. So if you're doing it yourself, you, you know, you might have some more tools in your investing toolbox. And I was a hedge fund guy for 20 years. I worked for some big hedge funds. So I think that experience and, and insights I have can help you get there. People have said to me, I get some nice feedback and emails saying that I have a, a way of breaking down complex financial topics so that the lay person can understand that. And I hope that's the case. But like I said, at the end of the day, I am just one of a lot of voices in, in this big sea of investment podcasts. And what I try and do is I like to bring on guests who I think are very smart. They could educate you about different sectors, companies, macro issues, a lot of things that uh, – and I try and bring a different perspective to it and hopefully my guests do as well. Do we talk about different topics? Because I want you to learn. I want you just to have exposure to different areas, different ways to make money, to think about things in, in a more broader context. And when I bring these guests on, I think they have incredibly valuable insights for you. But none of them, nor do I, know what your unique goals are. We don't know what your time horizons are. We don't know your personalities. We don't know your circumstances. So while I or my guests can educate you on something, it doesn't mean that you need to act on it. It doesn't mean that it's good for you. It means it's something for you to think about. What, what hopefully I'm, I'm bringing to you is, is the beginning of a potential investment idea. You can get your investment ideas from myriad places. It could be newsletters. It could be independent research firms, sell-side brokerage firms. It could come from your own reading, your experiences, or your contacts. Yeah, but that's just the start. I mean, what I have found is that successful investing over time requires having a repeatable investment process. But that all requires having an investment framework. Now, my framework is centered on looking for market inefficiencies. So I look at sectors and asset classes that are at extremes, their highs or lows. When they're, when, you know, I'm looking for potential ideas where the narrative has created such a false sense of security and the investors supporting that narrative uh, are plenty in, in either the sector or the asset class or the stock. You know, so I, I hold the view that a lot of good news or bad news is baked into the prices at extremes. And what I do is when I see extremes, I search for change that's occurring below the surface that may not be noticeable because consensus thinking gets so entrenched in investor minds and they tend to carry that concurrent narrative into the future and into their forecasts. So in my view, my framework is about looking for market inefficiencies getting to that market early before the changes are understood, before they become popular, before they become respected. And, and Howard Marks, the co-founder of Oak Tree Capital, has said this, and, and I think it's so true. He says it's, it's far easier 
looking for market inefficiencies than trying to be the smartest guy in the room playing a game everyone knows and wants to play. That's consensus. So having a contrarian view, that's my framework. On today's interview, we're going to speak with someone who's got a fascinating investment framework and one who I think is worth paying close attention to. He's the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Endgame, The End of the Debt Supercycle. He's a Rhodes Scholar from Oxford. He's got Wall Street experience as a proprietary trader at a couple of big sell-side firms, as well as one of the biggest hedge funds in the world, SAC Capital. And he's the founder of Variant Perception, which is an independent research firm whose clients are institutional and high net worth investors. And he's had some huge calls. I, 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 I think back to 2009, in Variant Perception, he published a report that describes Spain as the hole in Europe's balance sheet. And man, he got hammered for that. Journalists, analysts, government officials. He was even described, I think, at one point as the enemy of Spain. But he was prescient, as he predicted, and as Spain experienced a very high unemployment level for an industrialized economy and a real estate collapse in general banking insolvencies. So he nailed it. And he has a variant view. He thinks contrary. He's a contrarian. So let's get uh, to my guest, Jonathan Tepper, founder of Variant Perceptions. Jonathan Tepper, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. That's a pleasure to talk. I mean, we spoke a few weeks ago. We were talking about a different topic than what we're going to talk about today. But I just, before I brought you on, I, I spent a lot of time talking about uh, – you know, where you came from and uh, what you're doing now. But, but why don't you let my, my, our listeners hear that in your own voice? Tell us how you, how you got to where you are and, and variant perceptions. Give us a little bit of your background. Sure. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be on the uh, podcast. So I started variant perception with uh, a couple colleagues back in early 2009. And uh, the, the origin of variant perception was really somewhat accidental uh, in the sense that I used to be a prop trader uh, in, in London uh, back during 05 to 07, right before the uh, recession in the U.S. I was at Bank of America at the time, and I was uh, trading interest rates and currencies, but really spending an enormous amount of time looking at the subprime crisis in the U.S., which I thought was going uh, up. And you know, I, I was writing essentially weekly notes, which I was uh, circulating internally, trying to, in part, trying to. Um, you know, figure out what was going on, and I found the writing process very helpful. Uh, but also, you know, in part to try to get permission to to trade certain things. We were limited in terms of what instruments we could trade, mm -hmm. and I just really enjoyed the experience and thought that it was one very uh, good for research purposes. Two, it helped clarify a lot of my thinking. And uh, I ended up leaving the bank. They wouldn't really, really let us trade um, many of the things that we wanted to trade uh, regarding. So the um, mortgage uh, stocks or indeed the um, tranches, um, you know, the sort of subprime tranches and, uh, or, you know, or European, uh, you know, periphery uh, trades. So I, I left and uh, but I kept on writing these weekly and monthly notes. And what was very clear to me was that, you know, I was trying to predict when the next recession might happen because I thought that a lot of those trades would really start to move. You know, once the economy shifted and once a, a recession started and as I was doing research, I had a degree in economics. I thought if I found, you know, the right research paper, it was going to tell me sort of how how to forecast recessions. And, you know, I, I realized that, you know, nine out of 10 economists have missed the last four recessions. You know, <laughs> that's sort of research from the IMF. And yeah. so it's not that economists are stupid or don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, all, almost all economists I meet are fairly bright people. Um, they have PhDs from very good universities. So clearly something else is at play. And what I realized is that um, if, if you, most of the uh, commentary that you might read, whether it's in the papers or you know, even a lot of economic blogs, focuses on uh, inflation and employment. And both clearly are very significant, but um, they're fairly backward looking. So if you think of a, you know, someone who runs a real business, a CEO, they don't start firing their workers just because they have a bad month or two of sales. Um, likewise, they don't start hiking their prices just because they have a good month or two of sales and they don't start raising wages 
you know, for about a year, you know, I mean, wages are generally determined sort of on a, a yearly, like a rolling yearly um, negotiating process. So in a way, uh, inflation and employment uh, are very backward looking, yet these are the two things that most people spend their time uh, working on. And most of the things that lead the economic cycle get very little attention. And when you're investing, when you're buying stocks or bonds, what you really are, are doing is making a bet about the future, not about the past. And so I realize that most uh, economists and most models effectively are, are, you know, are fairly backward looking. And then even more importantly, uh, w w another aspect that's even less understood or discussed is the vintage data problem, which is that a lot of economic data gets revised. And so if you see a number in the, the Wall Street Journal or Reuters or you download it on Bloomberg, it doesn't mean that that data point, you know, let's say two years ago was the data point that was, um, you know, uh, it, that it was later revised to. So, uh, you know, jobs numbers are notorious, for example, non-farm payroll with being uh, changed. And the problem with the vintage data that issue is that the turning points, sorry, the revisions are biggest at turning points, meaning that the errors are largest uh, when they matter most. And that's one of the very big issues. So what I realized is that we had to, I had to focus on leading economic indicators uh, using unrevised data, because, you know, if you're a trader, you don't have the luxury of revising your trades six to 12 months later. So you can't just go back at the end of the year and figure out, you know, what a more appropriate trade might have been if you'd had better information. You know, so traders every day are making uh, informed decisions with limited information. And, you know, the, the question is, how can you become better informed? So my colleagues and I started basically building uh, leading economic indicators uh, using unrevised uh, inputs. And one of the things that we cared about a lot was uh, liquidity. And part of that is that clearly uh, stock markets have major moves when economic data starts turning down or when it becomes less worse, i.e. the sort of second derivative starts turning up at the end of the recession. But generally, because stocks are discounting mechanisms and you know many other asset prices are too, They'll start to move slightly before um, you know the the economy itself turns down. So what you really and also stocks go into you know many of the traditional leading indicators themselves. So what you want to do is get an, an even better advanced read on where asset prices are going. So um, you know and, and I know we'll touch on specific trades and things later. But for example, if you're looking at uh, commodity prices, they're they're very heavily dependent on global liquidity. So commodities tend to do fairly well when global liquidity is ample, and they tend to do very poorly when global liquidity is tightening. The same is true for, for example, emerging market equities. Uh, emerging market equities, in a way, are the marginal importers of capital. So what ends up happening is that you end up with, um, uh, you know, when monetary policy is tight, like 1997 or 1998, for example, um, with emerging markets, you know, the, the Fed had been uh, hiking, essentially, um, you know, earlier. And uh, or, or you're looking at 2007, 2008, where almost all central banks were hiking in a collective, uh, you know, coordinated way. Uh, you, you ended up with uh, a lot of the emerging markets ultimately doing fairly poorly. So we've created global liquidity measures. Uh, you know, we know that the yield curve leads uh, growth and it does lead a lot of other um, asset prices in relation. So we build global leading indicators. Uh, we build global financing rates. And a lot of this is because, uh, you know, money is fungible. And what matters uh, in terms of global liquidity is not just what's happening in the U.S. with the Fed, but rather what's happening, you know, with the Bank of Japan, with the ECB, uh, the Bank of China, um, even you know, the RBA or uh, New Zealand, there's quite a lot of information that, that can be gleaned at the margins. And so uh, my colleagues and I started building these tools to identify turning points. And, you know, the, ne the name of the company, uh, you know, we borrowed from uh, sort of the expression that's, you know, co common use in among hedge funds uh, comes from Michael Steinhardt, variant perception. What you're really trying to do is to find when these tools might disagree with um, market positioning. So we look at sentiment uh, positioning and valuation. And to the extent that our tools uh, disagree, then there's a great trade. And that might be on the negative side where our tools turn down, um, or it might be on the positive side where everyone's very negative. Um, you know, money flows by speculators have been pulling out and valuations are quite cheap. So, for example, in 2016, one of our top trades for the year, if not the top trade, was long Brazil. And in that, that was a, a very clear, clear case where 
money had been flowing out of ETFs and out of uh, mutual funds for you know three years, which is truly extraordinary. Generally, you might see a year or two of outflows, but not three. At the same time, variance leading indicators uh, and liquidity indicators for Brazil uh, had turned up and were improving a lot. So you had um, you know, cyclically uh, low valuations that were in line with 1998, uh, 2002, and 2009 in Brazil. You had very negative uh, sentiment positioning. And if you remember, the Economist had Rousseff on the front cover, and Brazil mm-hmm. was essentially a dire basket case, and our leading indicators were turning up. So if you fast forward uh, you know, a year, uh, you, you then see that you know, the Brazilian market has essentially doubled uh, in, in dollar terms. Uh, likewise, on the negative side, if you're looking at, you know, for example, our leading indicators were turning down very strongly uh, on China in 2013. And a, a lot of people I spoke to in the commodity complex were still fairly bullish on China and Chinese growth. Um, and all of our tools were telling us that there was a, quite a lot of tightening going on. And our chi- China indicator leads commodity prices. So those are two examples, one up, one down. But I'd, I'd say that one of the benefits of this, this approach in terms of what I started doing with my colleagues is that, I, you know, I, I do have great admiration for, um, you know, some economists who are fairly well known, um, you know, and, and, you know, you, you could think of half a dozen of them, you know, right off the bat, probably the most famous one, uh, you know, a while ago was uh, Rubini. But uh, what I wanted to do is to make sure that variant perception really was not a guru-led model. I am not a guru. It's not like I have some crystal ball that other people don't have. Rather, I think that if Variant could create a set of sort of robust, uh, repeatable, and scalable tools, then those would be helpful across cycles, and they would then mean that there would be uh, an objective, agnostic way of uh, you know applying those tools to make money across time and in, in different business cycles. So o- over time, you know, those liquidity and leading indicators have been a key part of, of the process. And then it, we've also built um, debt and currency crisis scores. And, and the reason for that is essentially to also find outliers. You know, so you want to find countries that will have debt crises. And, you know, those are often tied to excessive lending on the house, household sort of mortgage side. Um, and then currency crises, and you know those are fairly well understood, although a lot of people don't track the key metrics. But you know these often tend to be driven by uh, countries that have uh, high reliance on external funding. A lot of that funding might be short term in nature, meaning a hot money or portfolio flows. And so when things turn around, uh, you know, it turn turn bad. Foreigners can can sell local assets pretty quickly, which leads to a currency crisis. And a lot of the borrowing is done in uh, in, in U.S. dollars or uh, foreign uh, denominated debt. And so, what we're really doing is trying to find outliers in terms of the business cycle, and then outliers globally in terms of debt and currency crises, and and pair those with sentiment positioning valuation. And that's really essentially the essence of uh, variant perceptions uh, framework, which is not driven by me or a guru or a crystal ball, but rather by a, a robust set of tools. It's amazing when you think back to the guru model, if you will, how many guys had big market calls on something. It's just hard to repeat it over and over again, those big calls and get those big trades right all the time. I, I completely agree. And I think it creates a second problem, which is that if you do make a very bold call, well, clearly like events move forward, right? Data changes uh, week to week and, and month to month. And yeah. so – if you're married then to a very big call, and that's how people think of you, uh, it, it creates a very strong psychological aversion to changing your view. Yep. Um, and you know, almost all the people I know who are great investors or traders, you know, have very open, flexible minds. And when data changes, they they change their mind. And so, I think that uh, it's very easy to paint oneself into the corner if you follow the the guru model. Whereas if we're using um, data and you're very data dependent and agnostic, which I think is what the, the tools that Variance built are, are designed for, then as the data changes, you change your mind because you follow the, the tools. And so, um, you know, that, that generally means that the because these are leading indicators and leading liquidity indicators, you know, uh, it might be a, a little bearish before others are. Then likewise, you know, it will be positive when other people are extremely bearish in the case of, uh, of Brazil. But I think if you're known as, let's say, a bear on Brazil, at what point do you change your mind? And so that's, I think, the benefit of having tools rather than being essentially a, a guru, which then forces you in a way to sort of stick to that known position. 
You mentioned something earlier. You're talking debt. You're talking currencies and, and equities. How do you use those to form your view? Uh, some people, I, and I try and tell a lot of listeners this on the podcast, that you know, uh, don't don't just focus on the equity prices because there are many other things that could signal as to what's go, what's going to lead the equity prices with regard to debt and and currencies. How does that form your framework or how does that form your uh, view when you're thinking about it? Are they intertwined and, and or uh, do you absolutely. look at them in a vacuum? No, no. So I think that is another reason uh, why the way um, my colleagues and I started Variant, which is that you know, before I worked on the uh, prop desk, which was essentially 2005 to 2007, um, I, I worked at SAC Capital in, in Connecticut doing equities long short. So it was a very strange uh, transition going from, you know, bottom up spinoffs to essentially, um, you know, trading um, interest rates and currencies. But I had a degree in economics and I thought that would be fascinating. But what was very interesting is moving from one to the other. So going from, you know, only talking to equity guys to only talking to um, currency and fixed income guys, I, I realized that, you know, almost everyone didn't even look at the same stuff. You know, so the kinds of things that you would track as a government bond trader, you wouldn't, you know, uh, an equity guy might never look at. And and likewise. And so if there were problems in one corner of the market, in a way, it was pretty easy to be blindsided by them, you know, because people weren't aware of what was going on. And uh, to me, that you know, really uh, came to the, to the fore in 2007, 2008 and 2009, where if you had paid attention to credit spreads and you would paid attention to bank funding costs that would have alerted you to huge problems in the financial uh, system, you know, to the financial plumbing. And I remember I, I was tracking those like a hawk because I uh, thought that, you know, that's where problems were. And so you, you almost always see the TED spread, uh, you know, you'd see LIBOR OIS and things like that blow out. And it, it immediately, you know, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, you'd see that there were problems in the equity market. And so uh, I think that, you know, if you are doing macro investing, and even if you're doing, let's say, just straight up equity investing, uh, I think you have to be very aware of what's happening in other parts of the market. And, you know, I don't think equity investors are the dumb investors. You know, some of the smartest people I know are equity investors. But, you know, sometimes uh, I, I've heard it said that, like, the sort of the bond market's the smarter market. And I, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. But what I do think is that there's often very good signals that come from the bond market and from credit spreads that are, are useful and, in a way, lead um, some of the things that you then see in equity markets. And so I think it all ties together. And it's it's really about understanding sort of you know what provides the lead and what doesn't and and what's critical and and what's not. And so what we're trying to focus on very much is so the um, on credit spreads and the credit cycle they feed into the economy. You know if you're a CFO, um, you're much less likely to be hiring people if your credit spreads are widening. So that has a huge impact and lead on the ISM, for example, or on initial unemployment claims. So that's sort of how we try to put it together. So what are you seeing right now? Let's let's transition now from from framework to to the current environment. I mean, I've been telling investors who listen to the podcast, who subscribe to my newsletter that that I think we're much closer to a market top and, and to use any strength and sell into that strength. Um, I'm I'm much more bearish right now. But what do you, what are credit spreads telling you right now as you look across the landscape? Sure. So what's very interesting is that um, currently credit spreads are, are not really flagging uh, any real danger. Um, and so the, the the bigger question in my mind regarding credit spreads is, are they uh, correctly priced or are they uh, mispriced? And, uh, you know, credit spreads were fairly tight in to early 2007. And it was uh, in late, late 06, early 07. And it was very similar in, in many regards where uh, credit spreads uh, tend to follow uh, balance sheet health. So if you look at cash flow to debt, um, that generally provides a reliable lead on where credit spread should be. So, you know, when uh, cash flow is increasing um, and, and debt's being paid down, credit spreads uh, should be falling when mm -hmm. cash flow is deteriorating or debt levels are rising, um, you know, then credit spread should be widening. And so currently we're actually not seeing very much in terms of widening credit spreads. But if you look at sort of uh, almost all the leading indicators, whether it's uh, flatter yield curves, you know, so when the yield curve flattens, 
uh, net interest margins at banks tend to uh, become slightly more compressed. Yeah. It tends to become uh, harder for corporations to fund themselves and certainly more expensive. Um, and there's a remarkable uh, correlation between uh, sort of the um, twos, tens or fives, tens. Uh, and uh, and credit spreads and equity volatility. And so a, a much flatter curve, which is what we've seen for the last 18 months to 24 months, uh, tells us that credit spreads should be widening and equity volatility should be rising. So now we've seen uh, equity volatility uh, picking up, um, you know, and it's been unnaturally low. Uh, credit spreads have been unnaturally low. Mm-hmm. And I think that one of the main reasons uh, comes from sort of central bank uh, buying, not in some sort of, tinfoil paranoid kind of way, but rather when I go and speak to uh, fund managers and you know particularly the fixed income fund managers that they're, they're telling me uh, European ones uh, you know that one the supply of credit is uh, is restricted that they can actually get their hands on because uh, ECB is buying up a lot of it so then they have to uh, move out further out the credit spectrum and buy yeah. worse quality credits where they might have been buying higher quality credits in the past or they have to then make the decision that they're going to move out to other geographies. So then they'll go over to the U.S. or they'll go into emerging markets. And I think that it's that uh, lack of supply, effectively, in, in private hands that's been driven credit spreads down towards where they are. So there's been a, a divergence between a lot of traditional leading indicators and where credit spreads should be priced. And so I, I think that as volatility is picking up now, uh, we'll likely see the same thing happening with credit spreads. So one of the things, you know, if you've done accounting, uh, you know, the sort of in, introductory accounting, and everyone in the markets, you know, even bond traders should know this one. Um, it's assets minus liabilities equals shareholder equity. And so, uh, if you're increasing your liabilities, you're going to end up stressing your shareholder equity, and you know, you're going to create higher volatility uh, to the shareholder equity, and that's what you would expect at this point in the cycle. So. We're not yet seeing that in credit spreads uh, in any significant way, um, but I think that, uh, that that is where the fundamental drivers, you know, in terms of cash flow, the debt uh, would, would dictate that things are. And so, you know, we built dozens of leading indicators, you know, that look at the sort of the counting metrics at the national level, that look at the uh, leads in terms of uh, growth and leverage, and then we've also uh, look at uh, liquidity measures. And overall, they all uh, point in the same direction, which is wider, wider spreads. You just brought up an interesting point with the European uh, debt managers uh, maybe sacrificing credit quality a little bit to get yield. And uh, in, in the equity markets, right, we talk about risk on and risk off. When risk on, people are willing to accept more risk. And when risk off, you see to act more conservative. But that also happens in the debt markets. I was talking to a housing trader and and he was telling me that he's worried because he sees people just reaching for yield, big pension uh, plans, insurance companies, that uh, credit quality is, is far further down the, uh, the list of what they're worried about right now. Uh, and that can't come back to haunt you down the road when you start sacrificing it and it becomes risk off then. Uh, I, I completely uh, agree. And I think that you know uh, we, we see this every cycle where people – you know, take all sorts of um, uh, risks that you know only later come come back to to bite them. And uh, you know, I I saw that certainly in early '07, where I was asking people, you know, the sort of high yield um, traders how they were pricing high yield, and they were telling me that they had a correlation model with the S and P, and if the S and P was rising, then the spread should be tighter. And I was just thinking, like, I was scratching my head, thinking <laughs> that you know, if the S and P is going higher, it tells you nothing about the cash flows of the company to pay exactly. back. <laughs> you know, statistically, it might be pretty accurate, you know, in terms of how it's trading, but it doesn't tell you anything about whether you're going to get paid back as a bondholder. And uh, you know, no, no surprise there um, that uh, you know high yield spreads widen significantly. And the, the other big problem now, I think, is that you know it's not just in the uh, pricing of credit, but it's also the terms of credit. So you know, when you negotiate any deal, everything's always about price and terms, right? And so. Uh, the bond market is very similar. It's like, you know, what are your, what's the price and what are the terms? So pricing is terrible, but what's perhaps even more alarming is that the terms are terrible. And so if you're looking at the percentage of uh, loans that are covenant light, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, anywhere from uh, sort of 60 to 70%. And, uh, you know, which means that the 
companies can run further, uh, you know, with the uh, sort of, you know, whatever they're, they're doing with the company. And so your ultimately recovery rate should go down because you're not going to get access. You know, you can't essentially uh, force the bankruptcy early. And right. uh, sure enough, you, you know, a lot of the recovery rates that we've been seeing, even though default rates are low, uh, that they're, they're terrible. So. so investors, when they read the mainstay, watch mainstream media, um, they read the newspapers, they watch it on the uh, CNBC, they, they're seeing a lot of discussion about tariffs, the Fed raising rates, big deficits in the U.S., all this uncertainty. How much of that in what you do, are you paying attention to that versus off in your world looking at this other stuff? Because headline versus data. Sure. So um, we, we don't, uh, you know, Variant doesn't pay an enormous amount of attention to um, tariffs. I think one is these don't happen regularly enough to, for, the, for it to be a big issue in terms of, you know, understanding how tariffs affect markets. Generally, it's not very positive. But, you know, if you remember uh, George W. Bush's steel tariffs at the time, you had, uh, you know, the beginning of a U.S. recession going on. And uh, I would argue that the moves that happen in markets, you know, the sort of economic growth and uh, credit conditions uh, vastly outweighed any uh, tariff considerations in investors' minds. Um, likewise, Smoot-Hawley, you know, back in the Great Depression was not a, not a brilliant uh, policy. But at the same time, you know, I would argue that the credit conditions in the U.S. were far worse, uh, you know, and the biggest drivers of, of policy. So to the extent that there is a trade war, it's obviously not good. Um, but the, the other issue is, you know, I mentioned that what, what Variant tries to do is to uh, create tools that are robust, repeatable, and scalable. And uh, particular sort of geopolitical insight, uh, I've never found to be particularly uh, repeatable and, and not necessarily robust either. And so to the extent that uh, we can focus on uh, liquidity indicators or tools that we know uh, work across cycles, uh, that's sort of what we try to do. And part of it is that if you're thinking of how politics uh, feeds into uh, the investment in, investing process of most people, um, y you often end up with sort of completely paradoxical or, or counterintuitive results, right? So, it, you know, Trump was widely perceived to be a disaster for the U.S. market. The market went up. Um, Obama, for example, when he was elected, everyone thought that he was going to pull troops out of Iraq and Afghanistan and impose some form of socialized medicine. And so, you know, the obvious thing to do would have been to go out and short healthcare companies and mm -hmm. defense companies. And, you know, uh, in, insurance, healthcare, and defense ended up being among the best performing sectors throughout his presidency. <laughs> Um, so it's not really obvious that, you know, uh, politics does well. The only area that I've seen uh, it do well is there's an index, um, you know, on, on lobbying. And therefore, you know, if, whatever companies spend on lobbying, they tend to get a payback on. Um, but that's about the only thing I, I've seen. And so we, we just stay away from that. You know, earlier we were talking about Brazil and Rousseff was on the front cover of The Economist. You know, that was the time to buy Brazil and not to sell right. it. So. I used to work for Marty Zweig back in the early 2000s, late 90s, and, and Marty always said, if something appears on the cover of one of the national magazines three times, go the other way. And uh, it worked quite a bit. Uh, he and Joe Domena built a $10 billion hedge fund on that, so it worked pretty well. Um, let's yeah. talk dollar. Uh, I mean, the weaker dollar has contributed to easier liquidity, but as you see some of the momentum of growth outside the U.S. begin to slow, uh, Currencies outside the U.S. should start to, to struggle a bit, which could lead to a stronger dollar and uh, li weaker liquidity. Uh, what, what does that scenario do to your global growth scenario? Sure. So, uh, you know, the uh, the dollar sort of has a long uh, history uh, in, in terms of um, causing problems or, you know, really just impacting the rest of the world. So, you know, the, the U.S. Has, has long had uh, or experienced the Triffin dilemma, you know, which is that uh, your currency can be a reserve currency globally. Um, but, you know, it, it, it means that you can't really manage it for uh, domestic considerations. You know, you always essentially have to be uh, running current account deficits, you know, and often government deficits to be able to provide more dollars to the rest of the world. But if you do too much of that, you know, you end up uh, devaluing your own currency and mm -hmm. uh, making it less stable. So um, th th this is like an, an ongoing problem. So the, the, the world needs dollars, but doesn't need too many of them. And uh, and it, and if there's not enough, then it, no one's happy. So it's a, it's a fine line. Um, and if we're looking around right now, the, the U.S. current account deficit's fairly high. 
And more surprisingly, the government deficit is fairly high, where you would assume that at this point in the economic cycle, uh, you know, given that the expansion is about nine years long, the, the U.S. government should be running a minimal uh, deficit, if not as a small surplus, as mm-hmm. uh, happened under uh, Bill Clinton in the late 90s, where, you know, as you have low unemployment rates and you have, you know, high uh, capital gains um, tax uh, proceeds, then, you know, the government should be fairly well funded. And instead, you know, what, what we're seeing is that both are fairly wide. And so, you know, if, if you look at the what, what they call the, the twin um, deficits, you know, then I, I think, you um, those uh, put, put together, you know, generally do map the broad dollar index, not on a day to day or even week to week or month to month basis, but over a sort of, you know, uh, one to two year period, um, mm-hmm. you know, do align fairly closely. So, um, you know, it's surprising that when uh, Clinton is running uh, the very large uh, government surplus and the, the trade deficit wasn't that bad. Um, the, the dollar was very strong. Um, there just weren't a lot of dollars circulating globally, you know, in people's hands. And unsurprisingly, in the late '90s, a lot of EMs were also um, under stress. So today, um, you know, right now, w- what we're seeing is high budget deficit, uh, high uh, current account deficit, and uh, this is, I think, in part explaining you know, what we're seeing with the dollar. So the last since global financial crisis, the last eight or nine years, um, I mean, central and commercial bank liquidity uh, has been rampant. We've seen the Fed expand their balance sheet tremendously. You've had 5,000 year low interest rates. So the move in stock price has kind of made sense. But you've the last couple of years, though, you've seen that the Fed's balance sheet remain kind of steady, yet you've seen an explosion in equity prices. Why is that, do you think? And Especially when you bring into account the the flattening yield curve and and money growth that's slowing, where's the disconnect been in the last year or two? Sure. So I mean, you know, there's the famous uh, chart of the S and P versus the uh, Fed balance sheet, and, and once it went flat, then you know the the idea was that uh, it was a stupid chart, and you know one shouldn't pay attention to it. And I, you know, as I said earlier, uh, variant perception builds global um, indices, and so you know, looking at the U.S. central bank balance sheet in isolation, and not comparing it to what might be happening with other central banks, doesn't make a lot of sense. When you start creating a global central bank balance sheet, um, you get a much better picture for global liquidity than you would if you looked at the U.S. outright. And so, um, you know, when the U.S. was pausing essentially, then uh, the ECB and the Bank of Japan. And even the Bank of China sort of went went into overdrive. And so if you take a, a global central bank balance sheet, I think that's done more to explain uh, global um, – not, not only equity prices, but global asset prices um, on, on the whole. I was reading your work recently, and I saw you did a piece on multiple expansion and, and the impact it's had on stock prices. And I, I hadn't quantified it in my head. Over the last five years, it's accounted for about half the growth in equities. Uh, talk about the role for for listeners uh, of PE multiple expansion up to this point, and and where you what role you think it plays going forward from here. Uh, sure. So uh, you know PE multiples, uh, there isn't just one driver; there are multiple drivers, um, and you know some of it is inflation. So historically. Uh, when inflation has been high, people have given have uh, rewarded equity markets with fairly low multiples. Um, that was certainly true in the 1970s and in the early 80s. Um, you know, and uh, so you had a higher bond yields, uh, higher inflation, and and, and lower uh, PE multiples. And as uh, inflation came down, secularly, uh, you know, investors were willing to uh, reward equity markets with higher multiples. There's also a cyclical element to it. You could you could argue that the further away from a uh, a recession or a big crisis you are, um, you know, the, the more people forget that stocks can go down and they tend to uh, reward higher multiples to equities. So when you're nine uh, years into a an expansion and you, you haven't seen um, you know earnings uh, go down uh, tremendously then you know people are willing to uh, use lower discount rates and higher higher equity higher multiples for equities and I think that's uh, exactly the sort of thing that we're seeing right now which is the sort of further away you you get from a recession the more optimistic and, and rosy uh, valuation metrics become <laughs> 
<clears throat> so if you were listening to the gold bugs, they will tell you that inflation is just around the corner. I think I've been hearing that for a while from them now, but but I think you have a different view of inflation. Uh, what, share with listeners how you're thinking about it. Uh, sure. So you know uh, we, we've had it on our on our blog. So you know a lot of the tools that we have are, are only for clients. And uh, you know if any of the listeners today. Um, you know, do work at hedge funds or, or family offices. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend that they check out uh, variantperception.com. And it's it's fabulous. Yep. Uh, thank you. And go to the contact form, you know, and, uh, you know, we'd be happy to, to speak. Our clients are institutional in, in nature. So because of that, we don't tend to give away very much in terms of what our current tools and, and views mm-hmm. are. Um, but we have blogged about this, um, and it's, so it's been on our on our blog. But as I mentioned before, one of the things that we try to do is to uh, build leading indicators for liquidity and for growth. And one of the th- one of the areas also happens to be uh, inflation. So, you know, earlier I was talking about how CEOs don't uh, hike prices or fire workers um, just because a month or two of sales is good or bad. So, because of that insight, um, inflation typically lags the economic cycle. Um, when you're looking at core inflation by about 18 months. And so um, headline inflation is shorter, a shorter uh, lead. It's probably six to nine months. And, uh, you know, that's that's driven by, you know, the, the elements that tend to in, uh, introduce volatility into headline CPI versus core. And so if you know where the what's happened in the past, that because of that lag, it gives you a reasonable view on where things are going in the future. And that's the the, the beauty of being able to build uh, a leading indicator for, for inflation. So on the uh, headline and core side, it's quite clear is that we're fairly late cycle. Uh, and the employment rate is fairly tight. Um, initial unemployment claims are extremely low. And uh, a lot of the inputs are uh, pointing higher. So you have uh, higher inflation. There's no doubt about that. Um, mm-hmm. The issue is, you know, are we talking about sort of uh, runaway inflation or are we talking about sort of a standard run of the mill uh, late cycle inflation? And, you know, the, the answer, you know, if you go to our blog and see the charts, you'll see that this is not a runaway inflation. It's sort of a standard run of the mill um, kind of late cycle uh, inflation. And, you know, that obviously has quite a lot of implications for whether it's gold, uh, you know, you, um, you know, w- the gold bugs. Um, and I, I've known uh, quite a few in my time and in fact, it <laughs> helps so build spreadsheets for uh, a, a gold fund that a, a former um, colleague had started. Um, I, I think that the, the biggest driver for gold prices is the uh, real interest rate, and that you can actually find it online. Believe it or not, Larry Summers, who is no gold bug, um, wrote a paper um, on Gibson's paradox. So you can Google Larry Summers' paradox. Mm-hmm. And he uh, talked about how the biggest driver – of, of gold was the real rate. You know, why would you want to hold a, a shiny yellow metal uh, when you could get a real interest on your bank account or on bonds? And the reason that you would hold a shiny metal is that if real rates are negative, then there is no benefit to owning, uh, you know, putting your money in a bank account or owning a front end, you know, of, of treasuries. And so people then become willing to buy things like art and gold that, you know, have no real yield. And, and in fact, you know, might have some negative carry associated with it in, in terms of storage costs or, you know, the, the shape of the curve. And so gold, uh, the, the, the rule of thumb is essentially that uh, investors or savers expect about 2% real rates um, on their cash. And for every 100 basis points move away from that, you know, gold will move by X percent, you know, and it, it does change a little over time, but broadly you're looking at like 8 to 10%. And so, if real rates are zero and you expect 200 basis points, of, you know, real on your cash, gold actually becomes a, a, attractive. Gold becomes a terrible, terrible investment uh, when, uh, let's say, real rates are 4% and that's, you know, above that sort of 2% hurdle that you might have had, you know. And so then gold tends to go down by about 8% per year. And so the, the driver of gold, in my mind, is not ideological or the, the Fed's going to print and kill everyone. The question is, you know, would you prefer to hold a shiny metal or get a, a real return? And, and mm-hmm. if the answer is you're not getting a real return, then gold actually, you know, looks looks decent. I spoke at a conference uh, back in January, and I, I was very bearish on the consumer staples sector for myriad reasons. Uh, one being I think it's very hard for them to get much top line growth from a volume or pricing standpoint. Uh, I think they've squeezed out all the cost savings they could get and uh, and they've 
levered up the balance sheet to buy back stock. Uh, and one of the key things I talked about was was demographics and the impact on on the baby boomers aging and why it's difficult for them to get pricing and how much consumption uh, declines when they start to age. I, I know you guys have done some work on that recently. Would you mind sharing your view or is, is that something that? Uh, you know, sure. So a, a lot of the work that we've done is not uh uh, hugely uh, proprietary. There's, you know, and we're not the only people uh, doing it on, on demographics, but, you know, where it's relevant, we do try to tie it together and uh, write about it for clients. And what's very interesting is, you know, there, most of the research on demographics is related to the ratio of the prime working age to the non-working age population. So um, children and old people are in the non-working age group. And then the uh, prime working age is generally in your 20s to sort of late 40s. And uh, the, the, the ratio of, of those uh, is, is very informative in terms of the overall inflation rate uh, and, and hence uh, sort of interest rates. Uh, and obviously because, you know, but 10 minutes earlier, we were talking about P.E. ratios uh, with stocks and, you know, ev everything's tied together. And so uh, the the current outlook, you know, is for uh, you know, across like multiple years, because obviously, you know, demographics don't change radically from six uh, to 12 months. Um, and, and these are sort of multi-year cycles mm -hmm. and it's different for every country. So obviously like Nigeria and India have very high birth rates, um, whereas like Italy and, and Japan have extremely low birth rates. But broadly for the U.S. And, and Western Europe, you know, it's difficult to see how you end up with extremely high inflation rates given uh, the, the ratios that, that we're seeing of sort of working age to, to non-working age. So without giving away too much to non-subscribers, what, what are you seeing of interest right now that, that's on your radar screen that, that you think is most important? Uh, great, great question. So I think that right now, you know, the, among the, the bigger, um, broader themes, uh, you know, goes back to what we were talking about earlier uh, with uh, credit spreads. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, almost all the leading indicators uh, point to wider credit spreads. Uh, we're already getting the higher equity volatility, and that's, I think, one area that uh, viewers uh, should be paying uh, quite a lot of uh, attention to. So I've spent 20 years, 20 plus years in the hedge fund world, and I've read more sell-side research than I care to think that I read, uh, using it as just a, a primer a lot of the time, just getting up to speed. Um, but I had the opportunity to read Barrier Perception, and I, I think absolutely tremendous. I think, uh, I mean, I'm a contrarian. This is a contrarian. You take a contrarian viewpoint, but I think your work is just absolutely spectacular. How do, uh, if I'm a hedge fund, a family office, or an individual investor, I mean, how do, uh, how do you become a client? Sure. So um, the, the the way that we almost always end up with clients is uh, word of mouth, or you know we we love uh, thoughtful podcasts. Uh, we we've come to dislike uh, CNBC and Bloomberg, even though I'm sure there are many fine people who work there. Um, I, I know actually quite a few. Um, but the, what we love about podcasts, you know, for example, uh, th this podcast is that you know you, you can actually um, tease out ideas and develop them over time. Um, you know, and you're not you're not confined to like a two minute soundbite. So um, I absolutely love the ability to, uh, uh, you know, go over some big ideas. But uh, for the listeners to this podcast, I, I'd, I'd say that um, check out the Vernet website. So go to vernetperception.com. Um, we have a contact form, so uh, slash contact. And there you can just request access. Um, if you do work at an institutional setting, you know, whether it's in a family office, hedge fund or endowment, um, you know, they're, you know, uh, we're always uh, happy to, uh, you know, uh, share some of our material and go through, you know, our, our process. Um, and, and generally, uh, some of our analysts uh, are on the road and uh, we'll, go, we'll go visit uh, clients. And uh, you know, that, that's generally how the, the, the process works. We currently do not have a retail offering. Uh, we might in the future, which would be a, a you know, vastly pared down, but still a useful um, set of tools. But for the moment, um, almost all variance clients are, are hedge funds and, and family offices. So, but what's extraordinary, what we love about podcasts and your podcasts is that you know, the, 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 I think that the kinds of people who do work at hedge funds and family offices, you know, are like sponges for information. And so, you know, we, we find that there are 
you know, if you are speaking to a good podcast, generally, like that's what that's the kind of stuff they listen to when they're driving, rather than you know they're, they're like constantly educating themselves. <laughs> uh, when I pick up my kids at school and they hear me listening to podcasts, they they don't under they they say, Dad, how come we're not listening to music? But um, so. Uh, you, te- you wrote a book, uh, you and, and John Malden co-authored a book uh, called uh, what, Endgame, The End of the Debt Supercycle. Uh, what's on the horizon for you from uh, from uh, authoring another book? Uh, sure. So that, that was uh, almost by um, accident in the sense that uh, I was right that the early variant days, uh, you know, I, I was writing my weekly and monthly things and I, I, I sent it to, to John. And, uh, you know, he was, he came through, through London and we got a drink and like five hours later, uh, we'd agreed to write a book together and, um, you know, Endgame did very, very well. Uh, Code Red did well, not as well as Endgame, you know, yeah. it sold, uh, I think over 80,000 copies. Um, so, you know, there, I think there has to be a, a good reason to write a book, uh, cause it is a, a, you know, a labor of love. I had um, Danielle DiMartino on a few weeks ago and. And I was with her about a year ago, right when she had just finished it and was doing her press tour. And my God, it's it's a lot of work. Absolutely. And so I, after uh, Endgame and Code Red, and Code Red didn't do quite as well. Although it did, it did well. I think it was like forty thousand copies. Um, it was all on uh, unconventional monetary policy, and uh, you know almost everything that we were writing about, you know, in terms of uh, bubbles and asset classes, you know, it was, it ended up playing out a lot of it. Um, I, I didn't really come across an idea that I felt merited, you know, an enormous amount of time. And uh, I, I am now working on another book, uh, which I hope to finish in the next uh, month or two. And it is on monopolies. Um, so there's a website if people want to go uh, check it out. It's called mythofcapitalism.com. Um, and I, I use the term myth of capitalism because I think capitalism is about competition mm-hmm. and not just about turn on capital. And right now, unfortunately, in many industries, we've got lots of monopolies. And so there's sort of a return on capital with very little competition. And so, um, you know, particularly in the U.S., you have extensive regulations, which tend to uh, favor incumbents and hurt um, small businesses. And then you have, you know, all sorts of barriers to entry. And then regulators who effectively have been asleep at the wheel, allowing uh, mergers to go through, which never should have gone through. You know, the, if you think of uh, two companies uh, control 90% of the U.S. beer market. You know, I, I mean, clearly, um, it, I think it violates the letter and spirit of the law. Yep. Um, yet the Department of Justice, since the Reagan um, guidelines, you know, 1982 um, to today, it doesn't matter whether a president's been Republican or Democrat, they've pretty much um, done nothing on antitrust. And so uh, the issue of, of monopolies and, and uh, antitrust matter uh, all across the board. So you know, there's a reason why workers aren't getting pay raises. And part of that is that union levels have gone down, yet at the same time, uh, companies themselves are consolidated. So you have millions of people facing off against fewer and fewer companies, um, you know, when they're asking for, for raises. And it doesn't happen. So um, there's, there's quite a lot of academic research um, that's now coming out uh, looking at industrial concentration by city and county. And more concentrated uh, counties have lower wages. Uh, if you work in New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago, you're going to be much better off because you have more opportunities and choices. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you if you are working in a more rural or smaller city area, you might be a nurse that has only one hospital that you can negotiate with for your salary. Right. And uh, I think that this explains an enormous amount, not just economically, but also politically. How is it that Trump – you know, who's a, essentially a nobody um, politically, and Sanders, you know, who's essentially a former socialist who joins the Democratic <laughs> Party, managed to do so well in, you know, a, a, a two-party uh, election. And I think that if you look at it, a lot of the support for both of them came from areas where people uh, felt that their their needs were not being addressed. And a lot of this, I think, does tie with, you know, uh, fairly stagnant uh, wages where people at the top have done very well post-crisis. And the average worker essentially is not being rewarded in line with productivity increases. Fascinating. Jonathan, I can't thank you enough. And I want to reiterate to uh, to listeners, uh, go visit the Variant Perception website. It's uh, His work is fantastic, and, and I highly recommend it. Thanks again, and and when the, maybe when the book comes out, we'll have you back on. Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure, and it would be a pleasure to come back. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. I hope you enjoyed listening to Jonathan. He and I spent uh, about an hour on the phone 
a few weeks ago talking, and I, I thought his viewpoints and how he th- looked at the world was was different than what you hear in the mainstream media. And I thought it would be very interesting for you to to uh, spend some time listening to him, and, and hopefully you enjoyed it. That's it for this podcast. I will see you next week. And uh, in the interim, you can you can find me on Twitter at Footnotes First, or you can email me at Mike at Curzio Research. And I, I do appreciate the emails. I get some some real good emails. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you next week. Have a good week. Thanks. The information presented on Talking Stocks Over a Beer is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility.